Hello. Welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja. And today I'll briefly be talking about cognitive narratology. Now, this is a subject that occasionally people have broached in the comment section on my series in narratology. Now, I must admit from the very start, I don't claim any deep expertise in the subject. My opinions and what I'll try to explain are basically based in the recent reading that I've done on the subject, especially from an online source, and the link to that would be in the description, and that is the Living Handbook of Narratology. And within that, there's a really significant essay by David Herman on cognitive narratology. And I'm drawing basically on David Herman's work to explain my understanding of cognitive narratology. Now, David Herman is professor of engaged humanities in the Department of English at Durham University, United Kingdom. And he has some significant essays as well as books on the topic and is probably considered, you know, one of the most well-known contemporary scholars of cognitive narratology. So please keep these things in mind, and I hope that my reading of his online essay, which is available, and a little bit of explanation of it would be a good starting point for you to read further into cognitive narratology and to understand it better. So here is what I'll do. I will start with the definition as David Herman gives and then explain it a little bit, share my own experiences of using it in my pedagogy as well as in my research, and then give you a history of how David Herman gives us a genealogy of the term and how does he explain it. So if you went to the David Herman essay, which is entitled Cognitive Narratology Revised Version, right? On the link that I will provide in the description, here is how he defines the term, and I'll read parts of it. Approaches to narrative study that fall under the heading of cognitive narratology share a focus on the mental states, capacities, and dispositions that provide grounds for or conversely are grounded in narrative experiences. Okay, so let's dwell on it a little bit. So any approach that employs cognitive narratology, right, the focus is on the mind, its capacities, its dispositions, right, and then how does that play a role in understanding narrative, right? So based on that, then he gives us a few points to keep in mind when we think of cognitive narratology. One, how do these stories across media interlock with interpreters' mental states and processes, thus giving rise to a narrative experience or experiences? Two, how, to what extent, in what specific ways does narrative scaffold efforts to make sense of experience itself, right? So if you look at the two parts that he described of the definition, the first part deals with, you know, is the mental states, right? The mind, how does that make sense of the stories? And then, the second part of the definition then constitutes, and he explains it in the definition, how the stories impact the mind. So based in this knowledge then, one thing becomes clear. This is not necessarily a structuralist reading of narratives, which we have talked about in the previous video. There is another dimension added to it, and that is the structure of the mind itself, right? That is why he calls it mind narrative nexus. 
right? So cognitive narratology deals with the mind narrative nexus. And what does it do? It encompasses not only, and I'm quoting here, not only how stories can be used to build worlds, but also how such acts of narrative world making are themselves mind enabling and mind extending. So one thing that com becomes clear through this brief engagement with Herman's definition of cognitive narratology is that we are not just mapping the narrative based in the structure, right, as people like Grimaeus and um, Barthes and others and Genet did. We are adding another aspect to it, and that aspect is the brain, the mind, how does it process narratives, right? Why does it privilege certain structures, right? And then can the brain itself be restructured through a narrative experience, right? So a whole new element of cognition has been added. Activity of the brain has been added to narratology. That's why we are calling it cognitive narratology, right? There are other uses of it also which people have done. But the most important distinction to keep in mind in understanding the definition of cognitive narratology in opposition to what you would call classical narratology is that we are not just dealing with narratives. We are also dealing with the mind, the brain, right? I'm conflating the two terms, but you get the picture. So a narratological study of narratives which is Cognitive narratology will not just focus on the structure of the narrative itself, but will also focus on the structure of the human brain. How does it process information? How are expectations built, built based on that? And then what role does memory play in it, right? And then can narratives restructure the way the brain interprets or receives a narrative. That becomes important. Keep that in mind. And I will now move on to how David Herman himself explains it and try to unpack it for you. But do keep in mind, this video is just to introduce you to the topic. I do hope that you will give go to the website, The Living Handbook of Narratology, and read all the essays. They are open access but especially read the David Herman essay for a basic understanding of cognitive narratology. So while explaining cognitive narratology, Herman suggests, and I of course agree with that, is that there are two things that make cognitive narratology highly interdisciplinary. One is the corpus that it uses, and that is it can use traditional text, it can use online text, it can use recordings, visual images, videos, film. So that means different fields of study come together to bear upon it and to use the term, but also to define it. The second thing that makes it complex is the ways in which the mind and the mental capacities are studied from different fields, psychology and others. And so knowledge is from different schools of thought, different fields come together to define the term, which inherently make the practice of cognitive narratology multidisciplinary. But then he suggests that there are certain things that cut across these multidisciplinary approaches. And what are those? Number one, research on narrative as a target of interpretation. So a number of key concerns cut across the various approaches to the mind narrative nexus. And they can be linked to broad lines of inquiry. And what are those? One, research on narrative as a target of interpretation. Two, scholarships on stories as resources for sense making, right? And three, how do they use medium specific cues to build on the basis of the discourse and interpretation of, of what happened when or in what order, right? So let's dwell on, on it a little bit, right? So one mode of 
research, one thing to focus on could be, um, you know, how are narratives interpreted? Now, if you're going to bring study of the mind and brain into it, you're not necessarily focused on individuals or you're not necessarily focused on the narrative itself, right? What you're focused on is, okay, this is how the brain works, this is how the brain processes information, and based on that, this is what we can bring to bear upon understanding and interpretation of a certain text. So that could be one area of study, right? The second is scholarship on stories as a resource for sense-making. Okay, so if narratives contain represented reality, experiences of other people, then one aspect of that research could be how do narratives inform our idea of understanding the world, our idea of understanding each other. Now, if you have watched my videos on Mark Brocker's work, right, on radical pedagogy, this aspect of narrative is hugely important in that kind of radical pedagogy because you're already presupposing that the mind has certain schemas. Those schemas predispose us to view the world a certain way, and then when you read a story about someone suffering elsewhere in the world, then by a careful engagement with that, you can restructure the schemas of the brain of a student so that they feel empathy for people they would consider others. So you see, that is one usage of this research of cognitive narratology, which has pra practical implications. And the third part, how do they use medium-specific cues to build on the basis of the discourse and interpretation of what happened when or in what order? A broader temporal and spatial environment for those events. So an important thing to note in this explanation is that there are things emerging in our analysis, in our talking about narrative, which would have previously not emerged in structural narratology. If you have watched my videos on the basics of narratology, we would have stayed with the structure of the narrative itself. But since we have now built a narrative mind nexus, what we are also trying to map, understand, is how does the mind work? Work? How does it make sense of the stories, right? How does the brain function and how's the, how does it process narratives? And because of that, then cognitive, cognitive narratology enables us to not just map the narratives, but also the cognition function of the brain itself. And that brings in the research on the brain, on human mind, right? I know I'm conflating the two terms, I apologize. But scientific knowledge of the brain functions of cognition, and then does cognition itself have a narrative structure? If it does, is it socially produced, right? When we read a story, our expectations of it are not just now expectations of the readers, it's also our mind working through its own schemas, right, trying to process a story. So what has been made available to us then in cognitive narratology is that we are bringing two bodies of knowledge together, the, the understanding of narratives, how do they work, and how does the mind make sense of them, but also, more importantly, can narratives reconstruct or reconfigure our brain, right? Not its chemistry, but how it behaves when it reads a certain kind of story. And this insight is highly crucial into the kind of radical pedagogy that people like Mark Brocker and even Martha Nussbaum talk about, because what they are talking about is how to change the emotional state of people and their ways of thinking so that they can develop empathy for their global others. So narrative, cognitive narratology can also help us with that. So coming over to the brief history of the term itself, David Herman gives us, uh, you know, a step-by-step -step history of who theorized it and how. But basically what he's saying is that the, uh, the term has only been in use for about 15 years, right? And he then give lists the people who theorized it, right? Um, and what he gives us the distinction 
is that it is beyond what would be considered classical narratology. So he calls it a post-classical narratology. And what he means by it is that the, it uses resources that were not available to Ganey, right, and others, because they were just dealing with the text. But people who use cognitive narratology are also relying on the studies of consciousness, scientific studies of consciousness. So that adds an added layer to narratology, and hence it is called cognitive narratology. But he also cautions us that we should not make one mistake, right? And that is, and I'm going to quote from here, cognitive narratology itself carries connotations that it might be better to avoid by using other descriptions for this area of inquiry. In particular, it is important to avoid any conflation of research on the mind narrative nexus with what some scholars have characterized as cognitivism or the view that mind can be reduced to disembodied mental representations that are disattached from particular environments for acting and interacting. Okay, so that's a very important insight. What he's trying to tell us is that we should not take the mind as this disembodied self that can be dissected and scientifically studied and then take that structure to the narrative. The mind nexus narrative already implies, already implies that the mind itself you know, is constructed in the social. There might be certain biological aspects of the brain, but the way we understand things, we recognize them, the way our mind expects a certain rhythm in a story is also partially socially constructed and also in so many ways constructed by the very narratives that we are trying to analyze and keeping that in mind is crucial. Just as we cannot just assume that a narrative is there by itself, it has a natural structure. We should not assign the mind this disembodied pre-existence that comes and interacts with the narrative. So what then it gives us is the interactivity of the mind narrative nexus. The possibility that there are certain things that the mind pre-constituted may be brings to the text and expects it, but that in the process it can also be impacted by the stories. So I'm going to stop here because of course the essay is much longer than this and I do highly encourage you to read it. But I'm going to go a little bit of what people have done with cognitive narratology without even naming it. One of that is the field of radical pedagogy and I talk about it a lot from with by my former colleague, Mark Bracker. Now, the way he brings the studies of the mind and consciousness and the brain into his radical pedagogy is this understanding as to how we process information. Part of that is how are our personal prejudices or expectations formed? And that, he tells us, are formed because of the schemas of our brain. Those schemas are narrative-based, right? Our idea of what constitutes masculinity, what constitutes a man, what constitutes civilized, right? We internalize that. And in the act of reading, we bring it to bear upon a text. So his idea is that we cannot change people's minds on the surface level alone through narrative unless we mobilize the narrative so that their schemas are expanded and in certain cases overwritten. And unless we do that through radical pedagogy, we cannot create empathy. And of course, there are ways and methods that he articulates and expresses, which I've already discussed in my lectures on radical pedagogy. So to conclude, cognitive narratology, just about 15 or years or two decades old, the list of all those who have theorized it and are still talking about is provided in the David Herman essay. But the most important thing to keep in mind is that it deals with the mind narrative or the narrative mind nexus. The structures of two things are becoming prominent in cognitive 
neurotology, the structure of the mind, how is it structured, how can it be restructured, and the structure of the narrative. How do they interact, how do we read them and why, right? How do we make sense of them from the cognition point of view, but also from the narrative structure point of view, when those two operative terms are at play and we are using the knowledge from different fields and using different kinds of texts to map that activity of the mind, but also of the narrative, we are then doing a more complex form of narratology, which is called cognitive narratology. That's all I have to say. Now, with a cautionary note that this is not the last word on cognitive narratology. It's a complex field of study, and I do highly recommend that you read the text on it. At least read the David Herman essay, and the link to it would be in the description. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much for your time. Stay safe, take care of each other, and I will now see you next time. Until then, peace and love.